<laughs> oh, I know the scene you're talking about. Yeah, well, yes, it was, it it was improvised. Because, like, Scorsese saw it, and Leo, Leo saw it, and they were both like, that's really different. <laughs> Let's put that in the movie. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Story Weavers, the podcast where we discuss anything and everything story related. Here, we'll delve into inspiration, plot, structure, character, and dialogue, be it in books, movies, music, comics, television, or anything else. We'll be covering it from conception to reception. We'll be discussing between ourselves as well as with other creators and fans about their experiences, routines, and techniques. Join us and find your next inspiration. We're your hosts. Dean Bradley and John William Worth and, and this, this is Story Weavers. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Story Weavers. I'm Dean and I'm John. And this week we are actually going to be talking about some of John's work. Hi. John here is an author and he's getting ready to release the third book and conclusion to his Nocturne trilogy on September 29th. Uh, this episode is probably out by the time uh, the book's already been released. Um, but we want to talk about it. It's the conclusion to his series um, telling stories from different time periods in a small town, small fictional town in Maine called Nocturne. All right, John, so tell us a little bit about this new book you've got coming out. So the new book is called The City of Woe. It's the third and at the moment final part of what I call the Nocturne Cycle. Um, It's so far a trilogy of horror novels, each one different and loosely connected, so they don't tell a sequential story. Um, The City of Woe is about a young man, a guy named Eduardo, who lost both of his parents and he's shipped up to live with his grandmother who lives in Nocturne, Maine, which is a haunted town to put it very put it very mildly um and over that summer when he's first there several strange things start to happen and then gradually build up build up build up there's a serial killer there's a circus that comes to town and his neighbor is a very strange interesting boy who hears and knows things that he should not know interesting I'm going to awkwardly act like I don't know what you're talking about, though I do because I actually edited this book. So uh, <laughs> I've I've been involved with the book and with with this series for a while. Um, mm-hmm. So and I love City of Woe. I mean, I've read all of your books, Thank but you. they and they've gotten better every time. And but City of Woe, like I think of all the books, like it could stand on its own as its own novel. Um, really, really well written. Uh, it's really fun. Um, it, lots of teenage angst. Um, mm-hmm. Covers a lot of really good uh, social topics. Uh, mm-hmm. Absolutely f- fantastic. But Thank you. But what I wanted to talk to you about was how you came up with the idea for not just a horror trilogy, um, but having each one set in a different time period. The first one, Nocturne Hall, being set in the 90s. The second one, A Town of Night, being set in, like, 1913, 1914. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the latest one set um, in the early 2000s. 2002, yep. So, so yeah, so tell me about that. Was that something that you knew you were doing at, at the beginning, the conception, or Not did it kind of come along? Or, <laughs> no? So, it's, it's a bit of a winding story. Um, so, the original ideas that would become nocturne hall it was it was in 2009 actually in my sophomore year of college because me and my friends ray crystal megan and naomi we all lived in the same dorm building and we would often get together as friends tend to do um and we just enjoyed kind of you know bullshitting spitballing ideas because i was like the creative out of the group and all the others even when they were biochem majors and computer science majors it was just always fun. Like we always just had fun just oh, like yeah. using our imaginations to do stuff. And I remember there was a night where I just came, we just kind of collectively came up with this idea of 
a hospital with nine floors being brought down to hell, and then each floor being a different level of hell, like Dante's Inferno. Okay, and then the only so, other so image, is that where the nine comes in? Has yep. to do with nine? Okay. And then the only other image that I remember from that night, from that like bullshit meeting, was a person, an androgynous wo- person, man or woman, in a, in a suit of armor with a long sword in a field of snow. And those were literally the, the two images of Nocturne Hall that, you know, later became part of the book. And Nocturne Hall came about very soon after I published my first novel, The Boy okay. Unstuck in Time. Because at the time, I remember reading somewhere, it's like, it's best to try to like put out books quickly because, mm-hmm. you know, Amazon and money and all that stuff. So I remember I had this idea that I'd always wanted to write. I, I'm a horror fan. I like mm-hmm. horror, you know. I wouldn't say it's a guilty pleasure because I enjoy it too much to be guilty about it. <laughs> do, you, do you now? Do you prefer books or or movies or haunted houses or <laughs> all of them? Um, everything for different reasons. Everything. Um, yeah. It depends on the story. It depends on my mood because it's just like what I say about books versus scripts or, or movies. Rather, it, it depends on how you want to tell the story and what you want the story to do. Books do different things than movies and the haunted house experience is different from video game experience. You know, it, it, it mm-hmm. all, it hits the, the nerve centers and the fear center of a human, yeah. but in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, Nocturne Hall, I pretty much pumped that book out in like four months, which wow. is shockingly fast for me because I like to sit on my stuff and think about it. Mm-hmm. But I outlined the book. I was gonna say. I was I, gonna say. You. You. I'm pretty sure you're the planner type. I definitely. You'll, you'll I, I am the planner type. You'll write drafts except for and, one. There's yeah. one novel I haven't planned out, and I'll. It's the next one. Um, oh boy! Even I don't know about this one yet, and I'm, <laughs> I'm aware of most of his future writing. Oh, plans, this is but. no. This is a town of night. This is a town of night. I didn't plan out. Oh, okay. So, but Nocturne Hall. You know, I put it out. I think in like. August of 2017, but it took four months mm-hmm. to write. And, you know, I was very, very happy with it. You know, it was, I, I thought of the book like a, a stab to the gut, just like a very quick like, oh, yeah. kind of it's movement. Just, it's just kind it of like, not, it's like nonstop, just. Very yeah. evil dead. Like looking oh, back yes. on it now, especially, I see how ridiculous and comedic the book is in parts. Oh, yeah. Like Some the, of like the violence and gore is just so over the top, but because it's that over the top like that's what makes it entertaining exactly it's it's very tongue-in-cheek and i remember that the first review i got for the book was a very negative review (laughs) so this is great advertising for me um it's a two-star review and this guy was essentially saying that he, he started the book with it looked really good you know he enjoyed the violence and all the characters and the the pace of it but then he said it started getting into nihilism which my friend it's a horror novel what do you expect (laughs) um he was saying he was saying like this book condones homosexuality which is like okay okay just just this guy was probably not the target audience of this novel (laughs) yeah i don't even know how no i don't know (laughs) i mean there's nothing in any of your books that would make me suggest that if anything when you bring up the topic you you are tongue in cheek about it oh yeah no it's like even the nihilism like i remember because other people have said like you know my work can be kind of pessimistic and a little very dark but essentially this book it's about characters being dragged down to hell Mm -hmm. and it's like there is no salvation they're they're not going to suddenly be given life it's like they are all dead (laughs) but these characters don't stop fighting to try to get something better so mm-hmm. and it's like it's never really commented on it's never really spoken about but it's like that's why i find i mean there's this whole talk we could have at some point about like you know modernism and postmodernism and post postmodernism but it's kind of like balancing that nihilism and the cold clinical feeling with trying to reconcile with and trying to survive in with it with hope exactly so you know so i read that review and i was like yeah good job <laughs> um, go me. <laughs> and and I, originally, Nocturne Hall was supposed to be just a one off book. And then uh-huh. I move on to the next thing. Yeah. But there was just something intriguing because even though they were thin as cardboard, 
and the town of Nocturne only appears in like the first like 15 pages of the book. There was just something mm-hmm. about it. I was like, Did this just, I just want to explore this more. Yeah, what There's else what, what, what else could I do with this? Exactly. So I thought, gee, what if I make it into a series, like an ongoing series I just constantly add to? Mm-hmm. And that's what A Town of Night came in because I like Lovecraft. Um, mm-hmm. And A Doesn't. Town of Night was literally me aping Lovecraft, like his style, his oh, characters, yeah. his plot is – the plot is literally a detective from Massachusetts is hired to investigate the disappearance of a woman in a small town in New England. Like you can't get more yep. cookie cutter than that. <laughs> yeah. It's just – and even the warts of Lovecraft because Lovecraft was not a great person. He was xenophobic, he had a couple racist, issues. homophobic, misog- like every ist and ism. <laughs> yeah. Um, and but that's man, why, he like, knew how to write horror. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, he, he did, and it's like the fact that his style was so overbearing, and yet that became that became a genre in and of itself. That overbearing, adjective filled style of yep. just using every word that you can in the dictionary, <laughs> um, and it's and like many I do, that aren't. <laughs> and I I do criticize Lovecraft in some ways in the book because like one of the char- two, two of the main characters make the comment about Jews. Mm-hmm. Which is like, yeah, that that that's what Lovecraft would do, and that's what would be said in that time period. Um, so you were you were going to try and write a whole and a, a, a whole series, bunch, an ongoing an series. homage to Lovecraft, but not just horror in, inspired by Lovecraft, but actually writing styles and yes. themes and writing in his style, including some of his. Uh, less than kosher views. Exactly, exactly that. And that's why, like, one of the characters, it's never confirmed or denied, and I can't even say if she is or not, like, one of the main characters is a lesbian, or suggested Mm -hmm. to be a lesbian, which, back in Lovecraft's day, one, he would hate a character like that. Two, they would never be able to publish something that risque, even though, reading the book, you would say, what's risque about this? Right. Looking at it from a modern lens. Pardon the interruption, but we just want to take a moment to remind all of our listeners about this month's Book of the Month that we're currently working on. For this first Book of the Month, we're reading The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson, a fantastic nonfiction book about Winston Churchill's first year as Prime Minister, which also coincided with the first year of World War II in Europe, or one of the first years of World War II, as well as the beginning of the London bombings. The book follow is a very intimate portrait of the Churchill family, the inner workings of England's politics at the time, as well as America's, and also a look into the individual lives of different Londoners during the bombings. Very insightful, as I said, very intimate. It has both a grand scale and very small. Um, it's a very good book, I can say, and as a slow reader, as I said last time. Um, have, have you finished it yet, John? I'm almost there, Brad. Don't rush me. Almost done. Um, no spoilers, too. I want to know who wins. Um, <laughs> but I'm very much enjoying the book. So I, I hope you are as well, our dear uh, listeners. I've, I've, I, I've been loving it. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm kind of a history buff. You know, I wouldn't consider myself. You mentioned you checked uh, out some other buff. things, too. Yeah, no, I enjoy history. So, yeah, no, I wanted to, I wanted to see other portrayals of Churchill because he was – quite the character um and so i watched gary oldman play him in darkest hour oscar uh, winner f- yes it's a film about churchill becoming prime minister basically it's about his in the days leading up to and the day of his being coming prime minister which is in this book Abs- actually too that it seems- is in this book mm-hmm. um absolutely fantastic movie uh, and then i also watched the second part of a two-part documentary I uh, didn't watch the first part yet, but the second part is called Into the Storm. Uh, it's World War II kind of focuses mainly on Churchill over the course of World War II, not just the first year or the beginning like the other two were. So it's kind of fun to see uh, different portrayals, which aspects of Churchill's personality and life uh, each one decided to either include or exclude. So that was kind of fun. So if you've been enjoying uh, The Splendid and the Vile and are looking for more uh winston churchill and world war ii Uh, i would highly recommend the film darkest hour and the documentary into the storm uh the first part of it is called the gathering storm so been wonderful so far loving it 
good. I'm glad I've been enjoying it very much as familiar as I am with history. I've been learning some things from it. So yeah, it's been wonderful. So our next episode, next week's episode, will actually cover The Splendid and the Vile because we'll be done with it by then and we'll be discussing it. Um, We'll be sharing our thoughts, our critiques. So please, if you've been following along, if you've been reading it with us, please tune in. Uh, Feel free to chime in, email, YouTube comments, etc. to share what you think, what you agree with, what you don't agree with. And we hope to see you then. And now back to the episode. We resume your regularly scheduled programming. Thank you. Um, this was also around the time I started to kind of look at the Nocturne series that I was mm-hmm. writing as almost like an evaluation of horror, like seeing its evolution because Nocturne Hall and A Town of Night can't be much different. Style wise, right. maybe they're close, but like I recognize that Nocturne Hall was very gory, very ridiculous, very borderline comedy, whereas mm-hmm. A Town of Night is very grim and very focused. Oh, it's, it's on a full on dark detective novel. Exactly. I and, you know, I enjoyed The Town of Night. And I, as I said before, that was a book I actually didn't outline at all. The way I describe it, it's very David Lynchy and how I came up with it. It has like, it had like a clothesline in my head. Mm-hmm. And I had a bunch of like pictures kind of hung from it, different scenes I wanted to include with nothing in between. And it was pretty much just getting from one to another. So you and just kind of started writing and knowing what needed to happen next and Exactly. And some scenes were added went. spontaneously. Some were added very late. Like the church scene was added in like oh, the third draft. Before that, the that there, there was nothing. And it's like there was a long stretch of the book where it was just investigation. Uh-huh. So – it was a very, it was a novel that was very much, ev- er, it evolved as time went on. And it was I a imagine, fun experience. I imagine you learned a lot about your writing style and where your mind tends to make connections and where your mind wants to conclude things. Right. It was very much so because one of the things I like about that writing style, and again, David Lynch has said this and others like it, creates a very dreamlike atmosphere because things don't mm-hmm. seem to have a rhyme or reason for why they happen. They just happen, and it's mm-hmm. dream logic, which might kind of be what I was going for. Yeah. Like this kind of like though, meandering kind of mess. Because it doesn't read like that. It doesn't read like it was written that way. It reads like it was thought Plotted out. But out. You're all, you also do like a hell of a lot of editing you go through multiple drafts of books at least four. before you even yep. let anyone read it yep yep i mean the fantasy so. trilogy i just finished it's like 15 1600 pages in book form and it's like i finished the third draft and it's like i'm very the first draft i was like no one has ever seen this <laughs> <laughs> and i won't destroy it but it's like i will burn it before i let someone see it um but now so nocturne hall it definitely was an experiment and it was it was enjoyable, but I wouldn't do it for any book, like the spontaneous writing kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Would you ever consider just like um, just for fun writing something? Not even that was necessarily like not going to be published, but would you use that as like a practice creative writing oh, tool? Yeah. Or oh yeah, because yeah, like, there are times yeah. where it's like I'll have like an image or just an idea of what I want to do. And I'll just write it. Like the the way I put it, it is very vulgar. I'll fart or shit something out <laughs> and just see what comes out. And oftentimes, again, going back to the fantasy book, which is called The Seven Stones, it's years from now. But the first draft of The Seven Stones, like I knew the story in my head, like I'd been thinking of it for years and years and years. I wrote the first draft of the three books. And it was, again, it was, it's horrible. The first draft is horrible. And then about a year later, I started the second draft. Mm -hmm. And the second draft, I was, I hate to promote myself like this, but I was stunned by how good it was. It seemed like something I couldn't have written. Like, there's no way I I could write this. It's too good. Um, But there is something for just, oh, go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. It's Donna Tart said this about The Goldfinch, which is a fantastic book. And she had to cut like 100 pages from it. She had to cut a year's worth of work in order to get to where it was good. She had to see what Uh, didn't work. And that's exactly what happened here. The first draft didn't work. And rather Mm -hmm. than try to figure out what did work, I was able to see, okay, this doesn't work. Uh And that was so much more beneficial than just constantly trying to start it in different ways. It's like, just do it. Just put something out and see what works and then move on. Yeah, I got to figure that out. As a 
in, in my own creative ventures, I'm definitely the one that like has an idea, starts it, tries it, doesn't like what it is, and then go- goes on to something else. And I've learned over time, and especially over the last few years, just about myself and my processes, that that's probably why a lot of the projects I start don't necessarily, that I start for me, at least, mm-hmm. don't necessarily go to the end because I'll find something else. I'll get in my own head. I'll find a reason why I don't think it's good enough. Um, but there's also something, or there's definitely something to be said about just, like, getting all your ideas out on paper, like, get it out of your head, and don't evaluate it on any merit aside from the fact that you did something. Exactly. And, and that's then, part you of- know, and then eventually, you know, you can either come back and revisit it immediately if you want to, to try and see if it's worth working on, mm-hmm. or you let it stew for a little bit and then come back to it one day and go, oh, yeah, I forgot about this, but I have more stewing. talent and skill or whatever now. And so, yep. Hindsight's 2020. 20, and also, I'm the stew kind of guy mm-hmm. because I'll write a draft. And I'd never pronounce his name right, but the, the director of uh, Jojo Rabbit and the last two Thor movies, it's like Takiti oh, YTT know. or something. He's a fantastic writer. Yeah. And he has, he said he'll write something and then he'll literally put it away for like a year or two before going back to it. I do the same thing. I'll put it away for like six months, 12 months, 18 months, because then when I come back to it, I have as objective a view as possible. Any like, oh, I really like this paragraph. Most of that's gone. And I'm just like, is this good? Is it worth keeping? And it's like, then I can more ruthlessly cut what needs to be cut or change what needs to be changed because I'm not attached to it. Yeah. At least that's that's my motivation. I feel like that's such an important, important thing for creators to develop. Um, It is. And you've clearly been developing it and I'm sure continue to develop it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not, it's not an easy thing to look at your work objectively realize that it's not great and then not get upset about that fact. Right. (laughs) My thing is like, even if it's not good, is there any good part of it that you can draw from? And usually you'll find even if it's just a a concept or a theme or a character, right? Exactly. Just a little piece. Just take that, put it somewhere else or use it and focus on it. Like change the focus of the story. Yeah. Um, But anyway, Nocturne Hall Most of the way through writing it, I realized that like doing an ongoing series Mm -hmm. was unrealistic for two reasons. One, I would run out of story and I didn't want to jump the shark. I like doing the Breaking Bad thing where it's like, go out on a high note. Don't, don't, you know, keep going till you fire blanks. Right. The other thing was I didn't want to reveal like the mystery and the mythology of Nocturne. Oh, I, I wanted the, it to remain. That's one of the things I I can't stand about certain horror movies. They over-explain. Yeah. Or they what's, explain it all. What's, what's, oh God, what's the one? But there's like a hint of like a woman, like always in the shadows. She's like hiding on top of a bookshelf. Or is it the that, that's, her, that's hereditary. There was a scene. It is hereditary. Yeah, at the ending. Spoilers. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. no, it is hereditary, but well, I just remember not I, I know the the ending of that movie really pissed me off. Yeah, it, the, ver- the very the very end, like the, the last, last 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There would there was a perfect place to cut the movie and they didn't, but Yep. The, for for me, and this is not a spoiler because it's completely out of context, you should have seen him climb the ladder into yes. the Thank into you. the treehouse and then cut to black. End scene. And it's like exactly. Yeah. But no, they had to um, keep going, but Right. I always think of the Halloween series, the original series, the first timeline. When have you seen the Halloween movies? No. Oh, they're so good. Well, the first one's good, the second yeah. one's good, and then I like some horror, that. but it's it's not been my uh it's not usually my forte. At mm-hmm. least at least videos like like Stephen King I love. Right, um, the big one. Good. Yeah, but a lot of it's, I mean, his writing, not even, I mean, the story, his storytelling is great regardless of the horror. No, so the original Halloween series, the original Halloween, Michael Myers was a force of nature. He's a force of evil. He's never explained, there's never any reason why he's targeting those babysitters or Jamie Lee Curtis. It's like, and that's part of what makes the movie scary. 
you don't know. You can't right. reason with it. You can't reason with a hurricane. You can't reason with Michael Myers. And then in the second film, because the studio wanted a sequel, mm-hmm. John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, who were the two writers, John Carpenter, of course, the director, he they wrote the script and they made the reason Michael Myers kept attacking Jamie Lee Curtis because it's his sister. Oh, so now there's a reason. There's a, a reason which completely demote because one michael myers is now human somehow Mm -hmm. he gets thrown out a window burned alive stabbed multiple times but he's human yeah Um, but he's got a sister you know yeah he's got a sister and it's like that's the only reason he wants to he keeps attacking john there's nothing that says non-human entities well i guess he is a human entity I don't yes, know. Yes, he is a human entity. There's nothing. To Even say though in the next movie, he's spirits. supposedly possessed by a demon. How do we know Jamie Lee Curtis is a human entity and not just, you know, the girl next door? I was going to say a divine god, but because she's a fantastic human. But yeah, the girl next door. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, and then, then like, but that. Well, it's because all of a sudden, like, all, all you're scared of now is something happening to. Jamie Lee Curtis, and you know, right. like, that's his target, and that's why he's doing it. You can reason with it. You can try to fight it. You can yeah. understand and, it. Whereas yeah. before, why is he go? Why is he so hell-bent on going after these random women other than the fact that he grew up in that town? Yeah. You don't know, and because of that, you can't fight it. And I'm sure most I've of the asked, way... Oh, go ahead. Finish. finish. Most of the way riding through Town of Night... That's what I realized. It's like if I keep going, eventually either details are going to start falling into place or I'm going to have to explain it. And even in this book, The City of Woe, it starts to explain things. But it's like as soon as I start that, I kind of pull some rugs out from under you and then I say, okay, Mm -hmm. stopping here. Because part of the allure of it for me was the fact that not even – I didn't try to make it make sense. It does, right. but again, in dreamlike logic. Yeah. Oh no, no. I mean, it it, it makes sense. You feel mm. you feel satisfied when it's right. over. Um, any questions you have left unanswered aren't really like directly related to the plot necessarily. Mm. It's more of, but same thing. It's ethereal. It's why it's does a force this happen? Of nature. It's a force of nature. It just it is what it is, kind of thing. And that's. I don't think that's a spoiler in these books because it's kind of a staple of the horror genre. By that, the time The City of Woe comes, because, you know, Town of Night came out and it was very well received by everyone I spoke to about oh, it. Yes. And City of Woe, you go into it, again, it shows the evolution of horror, whereas, again, Nocturne Hall was the ridiculous Evil Dead borderline comedy popular in the 80s and 90s. Town of Night was the very, very serious, like Lovecraftian, mm-hmm. old school horror. And then City of Woe starts off as almost like a mixture of the two, the kind of Stephen King. I say to like, me, City of City of Woe is your homage to it. Yes, very like much that's, so. That is the book. I mean, and in and in way more reasons than just the fact that it's about, you know kids in a fictional small town of Maine um, Mm -hmm. where, like, people start dying. (laughs) Right. And it's... Like, there's so much more to it than that, but, like, it's very reminiscent of it. Oh, yeah. And I use that as, like, a springing off point because City of Woe, I plotted out and I planned. And for a very long time, there were two halves of the book that I couldn't figure out how to meld together and have them work nicely. And then I figured out how to make them work. And it's like the whole book just literally came. It was when I was at work, actually. Nice. (laughs) It was like for months, (laughs) I'd been trying to figure out like, how can this work? Like, how am I going to combine the circus and the serial killer and make that something popped in my head. And I just went to my computer and Yes, I plotted this out at work. <laughs> I just started writing stuff down. like, And it just, the whole thing just came out with that one little puzzle piece that fell into place. And it, this was the first book I would say where seriously a lot's going on under the hood. Like you said, it takes like yes. the Stephen King teenage summer serial killer evil vibe and it uses it as a jumping off point. And there's a part... There's a couple parts, but there's one part in the middle where a very cookie-cutter kind of Stephen King character 
takes a turn that you wouldn't quite expect. Mm -hmm. And the book kind of starts to go in a direction that Stephen King wouldn't, or Uh, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he wouldn't go in because he's a master storyteller, but like he wouldn't necessarily go in and it goes off into a different direction. Mm -hmm. Again, showing the evolution of horror. It's also showing the evolution of the 20th century and how we react to the world around us. Yeah. And you know, just how like the climate's changing other forces of nature might change too, good and evil. Yeah. But yeah, no, that, that was the, that was the evolution. And I guess that was the chain that brought city, the, the nocturne cycle to where it is now as a trilogy. And, you know, at the end of city of world, there is an afterword. And I do mention like, Oh, there might be other stories and characters from these books will appear in other novels. I just like how Alice and Donnie from the boy unstuck in time, appear in a town of night they appear at the Mm -hmm. very beginning yeah like there's a character from a town of night called laura who is a writer and in Mm -hmm. city of woe she's referenced but i also plan on her being referenced in another book i also plan on eduardo the main character of the city of woe appearing in another book in a in a in a role where he has dialogue and you actually kind of find out what happens to him. At least I plan on that. Okay. So Um, you do actually have a future for some of these characters outside of this series. Oh yes. Because some of them are just too intriguing. And also it makes the world because I didn't set out to write like all my books are like this Marvel like universe. That's not my Mm -hmm. goal. I want them to each stand on their own as much as possible. Right. It's just you start to see little connecting threads that kind of like connect them all. And as I often put it's it, it's just little um, like Easter eggs for people who read essentially, all your yes. books. And it's like if you look at them all collectively, they might all mean something. Like, you know, there's certain problems that all the books kind of work on, mm-hmm. like in their own way. And it, it assembles like this one cohesive picture. But anyway, we'd like to take a brief moment to thank you for listening to Story Weavers. For the enjoyment of our listeners, we want to keep this podcast ad-free and uninterrupted. If you would like to support us further, check out our options on Patreon. Plus, subscribing will get you behind-the-scenes content, bloopers, access to Book of the Month polls, and more. We appreciate any and all support. Now back to the episode. We're we're getting kind of close to time here, but yes. I did the one more thing I wanted to ask you about is um what where was the certain point in the beginning of the creative process of each book you kind of already touched on it on town of night where you decided like was there a catalyst that made you decide like this is an idea that i i actually want to like take time and write down you mean like, you know the, I mean? like the ideas for the book yeah, or, whether just starting to write the draft or whatever it was, like, was there a catalyst or something that happened that made you be like, I need to do this now? Or was it would just more like organic because you're all right, you were a writer long before you started mm-hmm. any of these books? Yeah, I'm pretty, that's my life. Um, so Nocturne Hall was, it's a pretty selfish reason. Like I said, I read an article that said, Oh, you should put out books as fast as possible. And again, I was new to the whole self publishing thing. And that was an idea that I'd been bouncing around in my head for years. Mm -hmm. So again, I kind of farted the book out to Mm -hmm. an extent. Um, And then a town of night came out because I saw something attracted me about nocturne and I loved Lovecraft, and I said, you know what? What what happens if I just try to write something like that, even if it's derivative, like the detective story, mm-hmm. searching for a missing woman? And I, a lot of these are like I have images in my head, like I have a little notebook or I have like a mm-hmm. word document where I write down like, you know, like getting alive or bodies hanging in the trees, like these images or these moments. That mm-hmm. I say, okay, would these fit in this story? Would this fit in this story? And I just like assembling these parts. Okay, um, gotcha. Yeah. So Town of Night was very organic in that I wanted to try it. And I wanted to just take these different images, these different ideas I had. And also put them into a time period that I'd never written in before, 1913. Right. Yeah. Um, and then The City of Woe, I would say that was the most organic out of the three novels. That was the one where it's like I took a break after a mm-hmm. town of night. And I was like, how do I want to end this story? What do I want to say? Cause while they're all loosely connected, 
mm-hmm. it does follow the Cartwright family to an extent. Yes. Yeah. Which you find out about very, pretty early on in mm-hmm. The City of Woe. And it's not a spoiler at all because it's like, no. it's very background. And also, just a fun fact Peggy Cartwright, the name of the grandma mm-hmm. in The City of Woe, was one of my mom's closest friends growing up. So. Aww. That's I nice. did it. I actually didn't intend that name. I named her Grandma Peggy, mm-hmm. and then Cartwright came in, and then later on, I was like, "Oh, I did that." <laughs> um, but no, like the City subconscious of the most, coming through. Yeah, which writing—that's sometimes the best thing. Like oh, seeing yeah. where your subconscious leads you, and then looking at it and saying, "Okay, how can I make that so it makes sense?" How can and I make being it so patient that enough to let it get there. William Faulkner, I think, was the one who said part of writing is just being bored and being idle. Like yeah. he would sit in Paris in parks and people would ask him, What are you doing? I'm thinking. <laughs> That's part of being an artist and a creator. Yep. And I remember it was around the time that Town of Night had come out and City of Hawaii was wrapping up like the third draft or something. That's when you let me know about like you wanted to try to get into audiobook creation. Mm-hmm. And that's when you because I remember you would ask that about the boy had stuck in time and you had sent me some samples. And at the time I was like, Oh my God, those are my words. I like, I was still <laughs> new. <laughs> We've all been Didn't like there, hear, so. hearing someone else read what you were written out loud. Exactly. I, I, I'm still like that. Like there. if you, if you find something from long enough ago and you start reading it, I, I can promise you there will be violence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I remember you sent me something you had done from a town of night. Cause you would, I don't remember if you had asked me, permission or if you had just done it on your own you sent it to me and i listened and i was like oh my god this is like your your voice combined with the prose like it worked so well i think i remember telling you that like it just worked because i went to film school so it's like acting and like listening to auditioning tapes and all that and it was just so interesting hearing you kind of bringing these things to life and i heard a lot of my the stuff i'd written in a different way than i thought Mm-hmm. that I thought of. And it's like, wow, this is actually how readers might be reading it and always different interpretations. Well, that's, was... what's been, that's what's been so fun about working on this with you and doing an audiobook, uh, producing an audiobook for someone who like I'm close friends with and who I mm-hmm. co- am in contact with on a regular, I mean, usually daily basis. Yep. Um, we were actually able to collaborate on it. It wasn't just, uh, you know, here's the book send it Here's back a book, to me go. when it's done. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, we're very collaborative. We've got a whole Google Sheets document with every single chapter and where we are on the audiobook and errors mm-hmm. that he has in the book and him realizing that he wrote something he didn't mean to write. and Continuity or, errors. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all sorts of things. So it was just, it was just a lot of fun. And it also, like, you know, instead of having to you know, audition for a book and hope that, you know, the voice you have is the voice that the author has in their head for their characters. Um, John and I were actually able to spend time, like, developing the voices of a lot of the characters to get to a place that he was happy with and that was comfortable and able for me to read. I mean, that was... Um, and it was it was a, a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, that it was especially with City of Woe, because, you know, the book isn't out yet, and we were doing the audiobook before the release, which is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's like, I remember listening to some parts, I actually changed dialogue or changed what some characters think, because hearing it was like, oh, they wouldn't think that, they wouldn't say that. Like, there's yeah. one instance in particular, and it's like, this character wouldn't think that way. Yeah. And it, there's there's a reason a lot of movie adaptations change. Don't, don't just take dialogue straight out of books. Because... Right. When you're reading it in your head, it sounds it can sound natural, but when you're hearing people interacting together saying these things, you're it doesn't sound natural at all. Exactly. Um, hearing the audiobook portion of it was it was a new experience for me and a fantastic one, just like writing Nocturne itself. Like it was a fantastic experience. Mm-hmm. One, I can say I have a trilogy. Um, <laughs> and two, like how you said, you could see the evolution as from book to book, you could see my growth and development. I could also oh, yeah. see yours as an audio person, as an audiobook narrator, because the fir- like Town of Night, just like with Lovecraft, very narration heavy, lots of big chunky paragraphs and chapters. And then you get to the City of Woe, and I remember there were parts where I was hearing you like gasping or like taking a breath, or 
you know, I hate, you know, I don't want to use the word condescendingly, but acting. Yeah. Almost like, oh, and I was just like, I, I remember sitting there like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, when <laughs> I was, when I was recording A Town of Night, I was, the thought of acting, like, I hadn't even really considered it at that point. You don't like, think yes, of it with audiobooks. Like, yes, you know, you're a voiceover actor. Um, but at that point, I hadn't taken any acting lessons. It was more of a me uh, putting my feet in the water to see if maybe it was a career that I wanted to get into. Right. Um, so, and it was great having you be the guinea pig for that. Um, and it's, it was pig. such a good book. <laughs> But back at that time, I was focused on reading the book and narrating the book. Um, and then I think between then and Nocturne Hall and now City of Woe, I've actually spent more time listening to other people's audiobooks and learning what I do like in some people's audiobooks and what mm. I don't like so much in some people's audiobooks. Um, and so I think that definitely helped develop that um, in trying to at least act a little bit. And plus, I mean, even the narrator's tone is a little different between books. Yes. Um, it's much more serious and low voiced in, in a town of night, just cause that fits the, the That's dark the tone. detective, Very heavy noir film type, you know, yes. story. Lots of cigarette smoke, shadows and femme fatales. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a fun ride uh, it has. working on yeah. these books with you. And I'm looking forward to, you know, obviously I love the fact that we're doing this podcast and working together. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully it's a long lasting uh, professional relationship as yes. well as friendship. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just kind of want to end with that. Let's just, it's been a lot of fun and uh, hopefully it's just the beginning and yes, uh, I'm, we I'm... appreciate. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, because there's one other person I want to thank for, because mm -hmm. City of Woe was the first one in the Nocturne trilogy where someone else helped with the cover. And I just want to give a shout out to my friend. His He goes by the name J-F, J-A-Y-E-F-F. -F. Um, he's a graphic designer and I had designed the cover and I showed it to him and I asked, oh, what's your two cents? And he actually took it and created the cover that it is now. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. And I just want to give him a shout out here. Oh, well, thanks, JF. Um, and thank you to all of you listening. We appreciate the support. Um, this was a very cathartic episode for John, I would think. Um, now that we're, you know, we're wrapping up the it's book, over. getting it ready for publishing, <laughs> the audio book's done, like all that stuff is over. And now, you know, we're moving into the point where we get to talk to people about it. Um, so this is very exciting for us as well. So thank you for being a part of it and listening. Um, and we'll see you next week. Yes, thank you, everyone. We'll see you later. Thank you for listening to this episode of Story Weavers. As ever, we're incredibly grateful to all of our listeners and contributors. Come back next week for the next installment of Story Weavers. Story Weavers.